Hey everyone, welcome to Filipina on the Rise. I'm Crystal Fabella, host and founder. I really hope you enjoy this next episode. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe so that you never miss out on new video content. You can find all episodes on most podcast platforms like Apple, Spotify, Anchor FM, and more. Thanks so much for tuning in and enjoy this next episode. There's so much of your life that's spent trying to run away from this Filipino side of yourself. And then suddenly I found myself in a situation where I was like running a company that's supposed to be talking about Filipino heritage and fostering yeah. Filipino pride. And I was like, how can I possibly be that person to talk about this when I spent so much of my life hiding from that? I can never be this perfect Filipino. And then I started like asking myself, like, what is a perfect Filipino? And wow. like, why do I feel this pressure? And I think once I finally leaned into that idea that like, I don't know everything, but at least I'm willing to learn. Welcome to the Filipina on the Rise podcast, where I spotlight Filipino women doing big things and making an impact. I'm your host, Crystal Fabella, and I aim to promote Panay excellence, educate the world about our culture, and celebrate what it means to be a Filipina. Today, we're talking to Jelaine Santiago. Jelaine is the co-founder of Cambia & Co., an ethical fashion company that exists to celebrate Filipino culture, craftsmanship, and heritage. Cambia & Co. showcases contemporary, conscious fashion made with Filipino soul, all designed and handcrafted in the Philippines by talented Filipino artisans. By connecting people to entrepreneurs and artisans in the Philippines, Cambia allows those businesses to finally access a global market. They're growing a community of conscious consumers and sharing the Filipino story. On this episode, we discuss how growing up in Toronto, Canada, Jelaine actually felt disconnected from her Filipino identity and roots, but how a trip to the Philippines gave her an identity and purpose awakening. She shares how her and her husband started Cambio and eventually a global movement connecting Filipinos to their roots through Filipino fashion, beauty, and culture. We learn about hard obstacles they faced along the way as entrepreneurs and advice to overcoming pressures when there's too many voices around you and really how to hone back in your root purpose. We then discuss why it's important to connect to your heritage and explore the common questioning of one is Filipino enough to be leading a Filipino-centered movement. Lastly, we discuss how you and I, wherever we are, can begin to create bridges with people in the Philippines and feel connected with our homeland. Okay, here's a question. If you are Filipino, growing up, did you feel proud to be Filipino? What did it mean to be proud? How did you feel connected to your heritage or roots? I was born in the Philippines and immigrated to Canada at a young age and eventually came to California at the age of seven. I was exposed and immersed in our culture in ways like eating Filipino food, speaking Tagalog at home, going to our Filipino parties and singing karaoke, playing piano for everyone because our parents gave us money. I even went so far and was part of Filipino cultural dances and did tnickling. That was fun. Anyways, these were the little semblances of my culture that I associated with being Filipino. But for the most part, I was Filipino by blood. But looking back, I mostly assimilated to American culture and tried to fit in there. So if I'm completely honest, I wrestled with how relevant the Filipino ways were to me. I knew I truly wanted to feel proud, but taking pride in one's heritage goes deeper than these associations. It begs the question, where do we come from? What is our history? Who are our people? What does it mean to be Filipino in another country and nationality? What does it mean to feel proud to be Filipino? We live in a world where those questions may not be taught and answered in textbooks, in history class, in school, but the beautiful thing is when we get to discover it for ourselves when we really search and through other people's similar stories. I love Jelaine's story because it actually made me admit this. When she gets open and vulnerable about how growing up she felt out of touch with her Filipino roots, growing up in a predominantly white neighborhood and taking to fit in with a more traditional Canadian culture, it made me realize this was more common for us. How cool is it that this person who struggled to embrace Filipino identity was now leading this global movement to help others get more in touch? This discussion also validated me in a way because I've often wondered if I have the right to lead conversations about our culture when I was guilty of not being Panay proud enough growing up. I hope it's validating for you too. But folks, no one is ever not Filipino enough. We all take a different journey and what's important is that we're reconnecting, being sincere, and continuing to grow. I can't wait for you to listen to this. But before we start, I'm giving a free gift of a Filipino on the rice sticker. And these are so cute, you guys. It's on my laptop, it's on my friend's water bottle. So all you have to do is go on iTunes and leave a written review and I will choose three people at random to get a sticker. Five star reviews are so helpful to the growth of the show and reaching more listeners so thank you so much in advance okay now here we go
Jelaine, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being on here. You don't understand how honored I am and also excited. You've been such a figure in our Filipino community around the world, just bringing our culture, our community, and you know what's happening in the Philippines, bringing that back in a very tangible way to everybody. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. That's so kind. I really am just so honored to be here and to be able to share Cambio's story and the work we do uh, with your community. I'm just really thankful. Yes. I love that we're both passionate about storytelling. Like this platform is really about the art and power of storytelling. And we're going to get into that later also, but you are also a storyteller and you have somehow weaved that into your work. So for anyone listening, if you haven't gone on Cambia and Co, go on shop Cambio.co, <laughs> sorry, shop Cambio.co. <laughs> And you will see it's not just a shop, but also there's blogs, and there's written articles by other people just really weaving in stories of Filipinos, of our culture, different perspectives to bring. So please give that a look. I was on it myself and I'm just like, oh my goodness, I didn't mm-hmm. realize how many handcrafted goods that we can find from artisans, from craftsmanship and people in the fashion industry, the Philippines. And for anyone to know, These blogs, these stories, these topics are so interesting. Everything from, you know, five Filipino fashions inspired by the spring summer trends to, you know, what my Filipina mother taught me about beauty Mm to, you know, things like that. And I just love the well-roundedness, the diversity of these topics and everyone like so Cambio and Co is really about showcasing to the world, right, about sustainable Filipino fashion, bringing it to a wider audience outside of the Philippines. And I love that because that's also what we do, just not just reaching our own community, but outside of the Philippines. And we're going to talk about later about why Jelaine is so intentional about reaching the community outside of the Philippines and just showcasing, you know, what the Philippine fashion and craftsmanship community is like. I feel like a lot of people don't even know about that yet, about what's under the hood. And in a really quick snapshot, before we get into the meat about your journey, about your story, can you just give us a quick snapshot (laughs) about what the world of Filipino artisans, craftsmanship, and the fashion world looks like? (laughs) Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Yeah. So snapshot of what the world of Filipino artisans and craftsmanship and fashion looks like. It's just so diverse. Like, I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize is just how there is just so much richness and like diversity and variety that exists in Philippines. So when we talk about Filipino craftsmanship, there's pre-colonial craftsmanship traditions that exist all across the Philippines, not just in Luzon and in Manila, but all across the islands, you know, in Mindanao and in Visaya. And there's just like so much that exists out there. And even in terms of like the kind of styles and fashions that we're seeing emerging from Philippines, we're seeing, you know, really like high fashion in addition to more day-to-day everyday wear. And so it's just like, there's just so much. When we first started looking at fashion accessories in Philippines, like, you know, people would tell us there's not that much in Philippines. Like if you want to focus on Filipino Mm -hmm. craftsmanship, you're going to be super limited. But then what we realized, the more that we looked into it and the more we traveled to the Philippines and the more we spoke to different communities and designers and brands, like there is just so much that's here and we don't even know it. I think that's just what is has been like the biggest learning is just the biggest realization for me personally. Mm-hmm. Like there's so much that you can do just on fashion. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why we actually chose to focus on the fashion side is because like yeah. we could, we could have gone in any direction. There's food, there's home decor, there's all of these different things, but just on the fashion side itself, like it's emerging and it's evolving and there's so yeah. much that has changed. Yeah. It's- yeah. I also love, I love how you, I think I, I read something there's power in this because fashion is so intimate and personal. It's like literally what we wear on our bodies and how our bodies mm-hmm. are expressing themselves and how they move through the world. So I love that intention. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Like fashion itself is just such a personal thing. It's like, it's literally what you put on your body. Like it's one of the most outward forms that we can express ourselves. And like, regardless of whether you choose to participate or whether you think of yourself as someone who's fashion 
forward or fashionable or whether you particularly care about fashion, like regardless, we engage in it and we have no option but to participate in fashion. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things that it's a way to also make a statement and express who you are. Yeah. Both in terms of like what you, the actual style and aesthetic of what you're wearing, but also the story that you're choosing to tell. You know, the story of like the materials that your clothing is made of, the story of the artisans or the people that make your products and if they were treated well. Like that's all part mm-hmm. of the story and the statement that you are saying as a person mm-hmm. based on the things that you're putting on your body. Yeah. So. And we're going to go into that a little more later in terms of being really thoughtful about not just how it looks, but like, where did it come from? Who made it, you know, and what story is it telling? Because I think that's looking beyond just the look of it, but really a way to feel connected um, to what you're actually wearing, realizing there's people behind it and mm-hmm. thinking about like, was this, this like how sustainable was this? Like, at, like all these things about like fashion and ethics and environmentalism and stuff. And mm-hmm. I think I did see that in the Philippines, there's this movement and a lot of, you know, the people in this are really intentional about all that. So I'm really excited to learn more about that. And I know that you guys vet out the practices and where it comes from. So um, there's just so much layers that Cambio goes mm-hmm. into and how you <laughs> The attention to detail is amazing, like literally oh, amazing. Thank you. So, <laughs> so uh, without further ado, Jelaine, in your own words, who is Jelaine Santiago and what is your present mission? Ooh. Um, okay. Well, who is Jelaine Santiago? Well, there's the outward way that I describe myself when I'm talking to people which is really, you know, I describe myself as an online storyteller. I'm a social entrepreneur. I'm a passionate advocate for diversity and ethics in business. And I'm a writer. And they're all different aspects that that make up who I am. And I think what has really guided me in the last few years is the realization that what I'm most passionate about is really sharing stories to inspire positive change. And I really like didn't realize this at all until I started digging into, you know, just some of the things that I've loved about my work over the years. And even when I wasn't working on Cambio and I was still working in the corporate world doing human resources, you know, I realized that the things that I loved was when I was able to really share people's stories and get to know people's stories. And so it's just such a natural evolution for Cambio to get to this point. So that has really been one of my main missions is using stories in a way that is really intentional and that is impactful and that, you know, can can create opportunities for other people. And at the same time, <laughs> the way that I feel about myself, I guess, and I think, yeah, I would describe myself as like just a big nerd. <laughs> like, I think one of the things that, yeah, I'm just a lifelong learner and I think I have gotten to where I am because endlessly curious and someone who is just always wanting to improve and wanting to grow and do things in a way that can be really intentional and serve others. Um, And I think that's just always been part of who I am and the work that I've done. I've always felt the need to do something that can contribute to other people's well-being. And it's been like a lifelong search to figure out what form that can take. But yeah, that's kind of who I am. And yeah. (laughs) I love it. And I love your emphasis on you being an online storyteller for you could have described it as like, I'm a CEO, like, (laughs) (laughs) but you really pride yourself on being a storyteller. And I do relate because like I always say, there's really something powerful about storytelling and how it fuels the work that we do. You're not just concerned about the end product. You're more concerned about how people are feeling connected Mm. to this because it reminds me of this one quote I saw reports convey information stories create experience reports are about transferring knowledge and then stories are the ones that transport whoever's listening across boundaries Mm. of time and space the story puts us there at the heart of where it's happening and your approach to all this reminds me so much of that because I don't think you just want to hand people like wear this. It's from the Philippines. Wear this. It looks like a headdress from the Filipino regions. Like you want to do more than that. And I think you want to connect people more deeper. Does that sound like right? Yeah. I really appreciate that you have noticed that because that's something, those are conversations we have about, 
we have within our team all the time is like, how can we dig deeper? How can we deepen our impact? Like those are actual words we say all the time in our team mm-hmm. meetings. And it's like, when it comes to representing your culture, you know, you can put on a t-shirt that says Filipino or, you know, slap <laughs> on a logo and be like, yeah, I'm a proud Filipino. But at the same time, there's just so much more that goes into that. Like how about, you know, being proud of the history that we come from? You know, yeah. how can we, yeah, how can we really be proud to be Filipino? We don't really understand what it means to be Filipino. Mm-hmm. And that's like such a nuanced conversation to have. And you yeah. can't just buy a t-shirt that says like proud Filipino and then think that that's <laughs> the end of the conversation. And what I, um, I was actually having a conversation with someone today about what Cambio kind of represents and really like the way we think of ourselves is that we're a portal to reconnection for Filipinos mm-hmm. in the diaspora. We're just the starting point for a conversation and wow. fashion is our medium for that form of communication for those stories that we're trying to tell. And so, yeah, for us, we that. always are thinking, yeah, it's, also because it's my own personal journey. That's so yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is exactly where I was about to pivot next because hearing you say it's like you want to bring it deeper to actually being connected and a deeper awareness about like why we should feel proud. And that brings me to how you grew up. And so you said growing up when you immigrated to Canada at a young age, at the age of, what was it? Of uh, two. Two. Okay. Mm -hmm. So young age of two, you described as growing up, you're always like kind of out of touch with your roots, you know, really about fitting in with traditional Canadian culture. And you didn't feel very connected to Filipino culture and community. And I can actually definitely relate. I don't know if anyone knows, but Jillian is from Canada. She's Canadian. And I also grew up in Vancouver. So <laughs> there was a lot, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Canada, a mm-hmm. lot of stuff there. And I think this is something that many Filipinos around the world can relate just because we do come from the diaspora of not being feeling connected to. And this part you said about you understood parts of Filipino culture, like the food, the parties, but there wasn't that immersion and understanding of why you should feel proud. So can you tell me about kind of like your upbringing and did you always feel connected? I mean, did you always feel aware that you weren't connected? I know that you grew up Mm. in a white neighborhood. Was there this deep longing or was it mostly just assimilation? That's a really good question. And the answer is like, no. Like, I didn't know that I was missing anything. I didn't know that there was anything that I didn't know, if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. Like, you don't really know what you don't know until you're confronted with it. (laughs) Yeah. I think there's a song that says that. I can't remember which one. Yeah. um, (laughs) Yeah. But for me, yeah, I grew up, like, in a very, like, a very Filipino household in the sense that, yeah, we would eat Filipino food every day. My parents would speak Tagalog at home. And like, I was surrounded by aunts and uncles who we helped bring over into Canada. And so like, there is always that immersion in Filipino culture, but there's no education. Like exposure is not the same thing as understanding. And so that's a good one. Yes, so true. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I think that's why there is that gap in like, well, I'm exposed. So of course I'm connected, but it's like, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or even people, you know, I think it was another conversation that I saw happening online today where someone was like oh well I was born Filipino so I know what this is but you know when I hear people say that I'm like we're born Filipino but we're not born with an understanding of what our history is of what our heritage is of what people's Mm -hmm. realities are in our community and there's a lot of factors into that right even just with like Mm -hmm. what we're not educated on right Mm -hmm. exactly exactly yeah it takes time and it takes work and it takes a lot of effort to do that learning and that personal growth. And for me, I the first experience when I really realized that I was I had these extreme gaps of knowledge was traveling back to Philippines for the first time after we immigrated to Canada. We had immigrated when I was about two years old um, to Canada, and then I wasn't back until I was 22. Mm-hmm. So it was like 20 years, essentially, of not of having lived in Canada and not having known anything about Philippines. And then I just remember when we had arrived to my parents' home, t- like to the home 
where I was born and where my aunt and uncle still lived in that neighborhood. And I just remember meeting all of these people like on my titos and my titas and cousins everywhere whose names I had heard and whose voices I might have heard over the phone. But I never actually knew who they were or like had been able to picture them in my mind as like real physical people in a way. And I think that was the first realization that I was like there's so much about my family I don't know yeah you know and what else do I not know Uh if I don't even know who these people are so I think that was my first realization that like I have some really big gaps of knowledge that I need to fill and the fact that I had grown up in you know mostly white neighborhood I went to university of Guelph which if anyone knows it's like very not diverse at least when I was there and so you kind of like don't think you're just used to that feeling of not belonging and I had always felt that way I had always felt like I was just different and I felt like this is just me I'm just weird (laughs) I have like a personal question for you then Mm. Okay. Yeah, no. <laughs> because it, what hearing what you're saying and because it resonates, it's making me reflect on my experiences of just assimilation and, you know, being in a more predominantly white neighborhood. And when it comes to phrases like Filipino pride, Pinay, mm. Pinoy pride, growing up, I actually never leaned into that. I didn't feel like when I think about it, I didn't feel the utility in mm. why I should feel proud about my heritage. And it sounds really like mechanical to say, but I was very about like, you know, like, but why? Like I'd have nothing to be proud about and it, it wouldn't serve me in any way. Mm-hmm. The, the thing that serves me most is assimilating and moving forward. And yes, I feel sad to say that that's how I felt growing up, but I just didn't feel the reason to do it. And now there is a lot of self-discovery. And I know that's something a lot of Filipinos are getting to later in their life or career and even now, but that, you know, it's great that we're doing that. But I want to know if that's something you can relate to and growing up like yeah. just mm-hmm. didn't feel the need to almost and how mm-hmm. that translated once you hit the Philippines and saw that, hey, there is something here that I can feel proud about in my identity. Yeah, I 100% relate to that yeah I didn't feel like I needed to learn about Mm -hmm. Filipino culture or you kind of take it for granted right because you're like I'm born Filipino my family is Filipino of course I know what it is to be Filipino and so yeah growing up I didn't feel like I needed to learn anything because Mm -hmm. I didn't feel that there was anything I was lacking and for me too also when I would see like beauty pageants or hear about Filipina celebrities who were, you know, achieving things and people were applauding them in their community. I remember just growing up and being like, that's cool, but it's not really <laughs> anything that it's not relevant. Me. Yeah, <laughs> like it just didn't I was like, yeah, that's like that seems cool, but you know, that doesn't also feel like that has anything to do with me. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And even like, yeah, because there's so many like Filipino musicians and artists who are amazing mm-hmm. and talented, but like also that wasn't, yeah, yeah, it just wasn't my language. I'm yeah. not a particularly like musical person or that just wasn't what really connected with me. So we're about to explore a great way to find connection with your heritage and culture, which is to find something within it that resonates with you. If you're an artist or yoga teacher or even DJ, look for Filipinos and Filipino communities within those spaces. Jelaine's sentiment reminded me about how growing up, I just assumed Filipinos mostly were into healthcare. Little did I know there are so many amazing Filipinos in different fields. When I moved to San Francisco a few years ago, for example, that's when I tapped into the Filipino entrepreneurial and tech community. Not only did I feel belonging and inspiration, I felt closer with my people and proud to be Filipina. So what was it for Jelaine that really hit home and strengthened her identity and purpose as a Filipina? And I think the first time when we went to Philippines and we learned about different social enterprises in Philippines and different Filipino entrepreneurs who were using fashion and business as a way to create sustainable impact and create livelihood for artisans. Like that was when I had that that moment where I was like, this sounds like I could be here. 
When Jelaine took her visiting trip to the Philippines in 2012, she was just there for family vacation. She mentioned she wasn't actually on the soul searching trip. She was just excited to go on vacation, visit where she was born, meet some family, but didn't expect it would completely change her life in any way. I asked Jelaine how she came to her aha moment while on this trip to the Philippines and of working with social enterprises there. As a backstory, she said her and her husband Jerome had met as volunteers for a nonprofit while both in school with a focus on using business as a form of social change. He went with her on this trip and while they were in the Philippines, they were just curious about what the social enterprise community in the Philippines looked like. They just began a Google search and learned about social enterprises like Rags to Riches and Human Nature. And Elaine remembered seeing products and how amazing they were, looking into them, wanting to buy them, looking into their stories and realize something. I just realized like there's just so much amazing work that was happening and that in many ways it was so much more advanced than what we were seeing in the social mm-hmm. enterprise scene in Canada. You know, there's just the level of work that has been done. Like Rags to Riches has been around for 12 years and I think Ant Hill has been around for many, many years as well. So yeah, it's just, it was quite yeah. amazing and to see also that it's Like oftentimes when I see social enterprises that are creating handcrafted pieces, a lot of it is, you know, it's very like, what's the word? Like a little knickknacky, like the the story, it's about the story and then the design comes as an afterthought almost. And so that's kind of been my experience so far when we travel or when I like see social enterprises that are crafting products, it's always been a little bit like very makeshift and yeah, design is always like the last thing that they consider. But this was different when I saw like Rags to Riches bags or, you know, Ant Hill's scarves and the products that they were making. Like it was just modern and their whole idea was about turning products that create livelihood into everyday pieces that people will want to use in their homes and that people will want to wear on a day-to-day basis. And that was just like, I think that was what really like stuck out to me was the fact that this was something that I myself would want to wear that other people would probably want to wear or that would want to own and that made it actually different than like 90 percent of the other similar businesses that I've seen trying to focus on livelihood but it was really just a google search so unfortunately Uh it wasn't like yeah like that was just the first part and then when we actually traveled back to Philippines again it was a few years later when we decided to create Cambio And I remember just the experience of visiting different partners and meeting them and meeting people in the communities and then just seeing the products actually being made and the amount of work and like complexity that goes into weaving of a a panel of fabric is like extremely complex and mathematical. Like I remember at some point a few years ago, we were attending a training. They were retraining the artisans in one of the communities in Ilocos how to weave because a lot of the the people they were not actually trained weavers at first so they actually needed to get like re-educated on the weaving methods and it was like an extremely mathematical process like they actually had to do calculations in order to figure out the weft and the warp and how the patterns come together and I just remember sitting there and thinking like this is an insanely complex craft like why do we not value this like why do people not know how hard it is to do this and why are we not paying them more (laughs) you know like why people not like really valuing the amount of work that goes into these things yeah I wonder if you think there's this untapped like community in the Philippines and if it's untapped for a reason I remember you saying that it's not the lack of talent in the Philippines at all it's the lack of access to global market infrastructure Mm -hmm. and probably other factors Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. It definitely is a lack of infrastructure that exists. And, you know, there is a challenge in terms of being able to reach people. Like right now, when we talk about the artisans themselves directly, like they're really limited in terms of being able to reach customers. So they end up going through middlemen and multiple layers of middlemen who will pay them very little for their product, for their work, and then end up reselling their product, you know, to other people. And so there's just that lack of infrastructure that exists in general when it comes to, you know, products made by artisans. And then when you look at the businesses themselves, like our partners, yeah, with like our partners, like Amami, for example, who makes their gold filigree jewelry, like earrings and bracelets and necklaces, they're doing incredible work. But in terms of like having networks 
mm-hmm. of people that who they could actually, you know, in terms of like figuring out how to ship products from yeah. Philippines into the US, for example, in a way that's affordable, that's extremely yeah. difficult for someone who doesn't have that network to yeah. be able to ask, yeah, or the resources to be able to like make it happen. And so that's yeah. what we realized we could offer our support yeah. the most. The, the like, resource for the logistics and the operations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so people actually ask me, they're like, oh, do you design the products yourself? And I say, no, <laughs> like not at all. You don't have to um, because there's so many of them. <laughs> yeah, there's so many of them. And the thing is like, well, one, I'm not a designer, but second, like, <laughs> you know, why should I compete with people who are already doing beautiful they work? Need, they just need the elevation. Yeah, the, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, they just need, they just need the platform to be amplified mm. and to have their voices be respected and shared. And that's where we realize like that's where we can add our value. Oh, I love it. On that, my favorite part about stories when I look at brands, at build businesses, companies, things like that, is like, it's never a linear process. You know, there's all these iterations and bumps along the way and even failures. So that takes me to this next part where Jelaine, in the point from ideating it to where you are now, I always like to learn about what were those decisions made along the way? Like, what did it really take to build something like this? And what were obstacles that you overcame along the way? I know that we talked about like, I like that you said like <laughs> every single year there's an obstacle. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's almost like you thought it was the last year of it. And that's actually so intriguing and refreshing to hear because you think that they're like, oh my gosh, it's so successful. It's built up. It's great. It's running. But yeah. it's like on the other side, there's all these like little failures along the way. And I think that's what is the most intriguing parts about stories and that people mm-hmm. want to hear. We're always being challenged to overcome our own obstacles. So can you tell us about those obstacles um, that you faced? I know that in the beginning, you started pop-ups and you had to pivot what the audiences that you were reaching were. Mm. Yes. Yes. I love this question because honestly, I think 90% of business is just like having the grit and determination Mm -hmm. to just see it through. And so, yeah, oh my goodness, in terms of failures or pivots. Well, first was our first vision of Cambio. We were actually called Cambio Market at first because we initially pictured ourselves as being a global marketplace of products from all over the world. So when we started, we did want to focus only on Philippines and Filipino crafted products, but then we kind of gave in to some of the voices that were telling us like, don't do it. There's not enough products in Philippines. You know, you're pigeonholing yourself if you only focus on Filipino products. So don't do it. And so we listened to those voices early on and we ended up having products from Philippines, but also from Guatemala and Peru and Uganda and places that like Nabij Roma or I have even been to. And I just remember that was like the first two years of our business. We were running that. And it was just like, some of the hardest years that we've ever experienced and you know it was hard for our relationship as well like it was really tough (laughs) it was a tough Um, time to be working on something that you are just working so hard and you don't know what's wrong can can i ask like because i think a lot of people who are starting out do this also you listen to voices and you Mm -hmm. go through even though somewhere inside you have this gut instinct that there's this hesitation to listen to that you listen Mm -hmm. to a lot of voices I've heard this a lot and so why do you think that is and like why did you follow that and like maybe where did it finally take like enough is enough Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah oh good question hello I'd like to give a huge shout out and welcome to our new Patreon supporters Allison and Millie thank you so much for your monthly pledge I love you guys because of you this show can keep going and growing and to you dear listeners Listeners, if you are interested in becoming a monthly supporter, pledging $1, $3, or $5 a month, and you get different perks, visit at patreon.com slash Philippine on the rise. And the link is also on the show notes. Okay, now back to the show. Where did it finally take like enough is enough? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, good question. I think it really stems from first, like as Filipinos, generally, it's ingrained to us to have an immense respect for authority, even if that authority mm-hmm. is not earned in any way, even if it's just from a title or from an Oof. age. <laughs> that, Stand up. This is yeah. real. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. true. <laughs> yeah, like we're, you know, that's ingrained into us is to have that respect. And I think particularly when you look at, the, at it for, as being a woman and 
for me, I'm a young woman of color and I was entering these spaces where it was mostly like a lot of white dudes and they have no problem or they have no qualms at all about offering advice, even if you don't ask for it. And I think, you know, at that point too, when we started Cameo, I was 25 years old and I had just quit like my first full-time job. And, you know, it was also like our first time ever starting a business. So you kind of are really just, you just flit around so much because you don't have the experience to say like, this is what will work. So you kind of lean more on other people who are supposed to have that experience with that knowledge. And so, yeah, like the first few years, and we also didn't know that much about Philippines, yeah. the amount of knowledge that we have now in terms of the richness and diversity of what you can find in Philippines, we didn't have that same knowledge or conviction back then. Mm. So we were really just like going and trying all of these different things. And, and, and you said that you were trying to cater to this affluent white yeah. market. All oh, yeah. like the mainstream all these- in quotation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. then that you said it, it was just, it felt so inauthentic or like you were doing what others expected you to do, which is like, yes, biggest life lesson for all of us. <laughs> but yeah. um, you just didn't feel connection to the Filipino story, which is why you started. Like, it's crazy because you wanted to start off celebrating Filipino artisans. And thing to relate to, like, when I started this show, I had a lot of people encouraging, like, why are you focusing just on Filipino mm-hmm. stories? Yeah. Like, you'll reach more people if you focus on like more Asian women stories and like, do you not care about those? And I'm like, I actually had to like look at myself like, wow, am I being selfish and just like not caring oh, wow. about other people? So he's wow. like, did you ever feel that way? <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, I'm not surprised that people said that to you at all. But yeah, good for you for not listening. But, yeah, it's weird. It's weird. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So what is a lesson that you have to give to others feeling that same way or hearing those pressures? I think that you really have to dig deep and understand why you're doing what you're doing and who you're aiming to serve at the end of the day. Because if you have conviction in your mission and your why, then everything else falls into place much more easily. And I think for us, one of the things that I wish, not that I have regrets, because I don't regret how our journey has unfolded. But I think if I was mentoring my younger self, I would tell myself to focus on the why and continue asking myself, am I accomplishing what I have set out to do? Am I serving the people that I wanted to serve? And if the answer at some point is no, then that's when you should go back to the drawing board. I think as businesses and entrepreneurs, like pivoting is necessary. Like we have to pivot in order to survive as a business. That's just necessary. But the what of what you're doing is different from the why you're doing it. And your what will change constantly. Like for us, e-commerce, an e-commerce fashion company, I would never have imagined Jerome or I running that kind of business. I'm not a fashion person and Jerome is like an IT dude. So for us to be running this fashion company, it seems a little bit crazy. But what we realize is like, this is one of the best ways for us to be able to serve our mission, which is to create livelihood for artisans and to be able to really celebrate our stories. And yeah. because of having that clear understanding, of like why we're doing that and what we want to accomplish, then it's okay to pivot. Yeah, And then you can more like effectively decide whose opinions you listen to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I like that balance of like, yes, you should be open to iterating and pivoting. That's what makes a good business. Mm -hmm. But also really establishing what you're doing this for so that you're not being tethered every direction Mm -hmm. that you're staying. I guess what stays the same is like the core of why you're doing this. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I like that balance of that. There's there's a quote. Sorry to interrupt, but there's just this quote. I can't remember. I'm so terrible at remembering names. (laughs) But it's a song lyric. But it says, if you don't stand for something, you will fall for Mm -hmm. anything. And I think that's just so true. And it's the same with like life, but it's the same with business. It's like, if you don't know why you're doing what you're doing, then it's easy to get distracted and to get, you know, to, to pursue whatever is shiniest or whatever is the most glamorous thing. Sure. And and yeah. not even with what people are telling you to do, but even distractions with what other business owners, what other entrepreneurs are doing around you and, and say, oh, like, yeah. should I be like that? Should I be like yeah. that? <laughs> yeah. It's um, tough. Like that's tough. And I think, you know, it's hard not to compare yourself 
with other people, yeah. especially like other businesses, that's super hard. Yeah. But I think the way that I've started to approach that is you need to be informed about what's happening, the landscape, yeah. but you also need to distance yourself a little bit and just also tell yourself like everyone's journey is different and you don't know what's happening behind the scenes. And just because a business is doing one thing, you know, that might be working, it might not be working. You don't really know what's happening internally, but you know, allow yourself to be informed, but don't allow them to drive your business and how you run your business. Yeah. That's so good. That is so good. I love that. And exactly where at this next part, so you reclaimed kind of direction of your business and what you guys wanted to do. (laughs) You were like, hey, we're focusing on the, I guess, Philippines, right? Yeah. (laughs) And you talked about this one time that you actually started getting feedback actually from the Filipino community. And this is another obstacle that you overcame. I don't know if you'd call it obstacle, but something that was that also taught you another lesson about mm-hmm. feedback that you were receiving. It's hard to hear about the way Filipinos were viewing your products and realizations yeah. that you like how Filipinos have internalized colonial mentality. So can you talk to me? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's a that's a big one. Yeah. So when we decided to make the pivot towards focusing only on Filipino products um, and centering Filipino stories, we uh, ended up doing a pop up in a mall in this area of Toronto that has a high population of Filipinos. And so we were really excited because we're like, this is our first like event that has like a high, you know, amount of Filipino visitors. It'll be interesting to see people's feedback. And what we realized is like, there's a difference. There's such a difference in terms of generations, I think, but also just like a difference in, in terms of mentality. And so the people that ended up coming to this particular event were people who were like mostly recent immigrants and who were also of the older generation, or at least like an older mentality of this idea that imported is better and that if it's from Mm -hmm. Philippines, then it should be cheap. And so that was a really grueling experience, to be honest, because that event was a whole week. It was a week long, every single day for like 10 hours. And we would just hear this feedback from these people that were coming and telling us like, oh, this is too expensive. Why are you doing this? Like, this should be 200 pesos. Like some like ridiculous things about just really like devaluing the amount of work and the value of, of our pieces, but also of our stories. And that's when, you know, that was really hard to hear. And it was really demotivating because it was also a very vulnerable point in our business where we were like excited to make this transition. But then that experience really taught us that like one, Filipinos themselves are, we're such a diverse community, you know, just because you are within the Filipino community itself, like, you know, even with this podcast, uh, you know, Filipino on the rise, you're not necessarily reaching every single Filipino. This is still such a niche audience that you're targeting, right, Crystal? Yes. And so you kind of realize that like, there's so many, like the Filipino community itself is so vast and there is people who will get it and people who won't get it. And yeah. like, that's something that that we learned after that experience is like, you know, it, we were in the wrong place and we learned a lot, but like, those are not the people who necessarily will would resonate your, with their stories uh, and with what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. And that was the first lesson, but the second lesson was also like, there is a lot of unlearning that a community needs to do. Mm-hmm. And that. <laughs> That there reflected that of, those those remarks yeah. reflected like yeah. oh this is where our mentality is at about what's made in the Philippines and who's there. Yeah, for sure. It it was so apparent that we had just ingrained and we had internalized so much of this idea that it's Filipino, then it's less valuable. If yeah. we are Filipino, then we are less valuable. Yeah. And wow. that's something that was super sad to realize, but then it also presented an opportunity to be like, you know, we can change that. Like, this is a story that we can change and retell for ourselves and that not everyone will be willing to listen to it, but a lot of people might be. And so that's really where that component of like sharing the stories really began to take shape where we're like, we can't just, again, put products on the table and expect people to buy it and appreciate it. Like we need to invest time into educating people and to invest time into telling these stories and building a community so that people will truly understand 
like what these products represent on a deeper level. Yeah. So that was like a tough experience, but it was a necessary one. Yeah, it was a tough experience, but it highlighted a need that you need to start weaving a narrative into this. If we really wanted to get into the hearts and minds of people and not just buying a product and not understanding why it has value and why we have value. <laughs> it's crazy. Mm, yeah. I, that's such a crazy um, like analogy that you have. Like The value that we put on a product made from the Philippines is like, why do you devalue it just because it was made there? It's like, do we value yes. us? Yes, you know? exactly. Oh. exactly. That's, wow. that's why I'm being um, mindful it's... right now. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that's also wow. is interesting and that I just remember being so indignant about is when I learned that a lot of these high fashion, like expensive brands are actually being produced and manufactured in Philippines. Um, <laughs> because, yeah, they were like the companies like Coach and whatever, they were hiring like bag makers and shoemakers from an area in Manila called Marikina, which is known for like leather making and really high quality, like craftsmanship skills. And what made me even more angry was when I learned that the wages in Philippines were going up to like, not even that significantly, but that these companies realized that they could find even cheaper labor in like mm. neighboring countries like Vietnam and Cambodia, and that they actually left the Philippines and left all of these artisans unemployed in order to just find cheaper labor elsewhere. And so it just was like layers upon layers of just the different ways yeah. that we have been oppressed and that we and have been devalued. Yeah, yeah, and exploited. And yeah. I just remember like being so angry. It still makes me so mad when mm. I think about it. Um, yeah, but now yeah. They, there's a movement that's reclaiming that artisan, the craftsmanship, and you're bringing it like, like now we're the ones representing, um, yes, Filipinos yeah. are representing themselves. And th- mm-hmm. that actually brings me to my next point. I really wanted to ask you about this because I remember you said you were in this point of time when you were speaking on behalf of your Filipino products and you actually wrestled with yourself for a bit. Like, do I have the right to be <laughs> representing yeah. Filipinos? Because you growing up never actually felt connected with that. And I want you to get into that a little bit because I feel like that's something a lot of us can relate to like, and get shamed about like, hey, you were never proud about this before. Who do you say you are now seeing on half of it? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> it's, yes. It's just there's so much there because I think like the first part is, yeah, like you said, you know, you grow up and you are not immersed necessarily or you don't necessarily feel proud to be Filipino. Because you don't know what it means to be Filipino. And you spend so much, like I spent so much of my time trying to fit in with like the white kids or with, you know, with my other Asian friends. And so there's so much of your life that's spent trying to run away from the Filipino side of yourself. And then suddenly, you know, I found myself in a situation where I was like, somehow life just twisted and turned. And I found myself like running a company that's supposed to be talking about Filipino heritage and fostering Filipino pride. And I was like, how can I possibly be that person to talk about this when I spent so much of my life hiding from that? And also, like, I don't speak Filipino, you know, like, I didn't learn, like, yeah, I didn't, wasn't really encouraged to keep speaking Tagalog. And I didn't know much about Philippines until, like, five years ago. Like, the majority of what I know now about Philippines and about Filipino history and Filipino culture are things that I've learned after we started Cameo and Co. And so I was just like, who am I to be able to be the one who speaks about this and who represents their community? Because no matter what, yeah, like, I'm just also very aware of the fact that like, there is a responsibility that's placed on you when you are in in a position of privilege and you're, you're given a platform. It almost feels like this like double imposter syndrome on yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It's super yeah. weird. Like, <laughs> like, um, like, like as, I think as kids in the diaspora, you know, people who are straddling two different cultures, two or more different cultures, you're constantly feeling like you're not enough because you're not, mm-hmm. you're not Canadian enough or you're not American enough. You never will be because you don't look like the Americans yeah. in yeah. like the Gap ads or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then you go back to Philippines and, you know, your cousins are making fun of your accent when you try to speak Mm -hmm. Filipino. So you're just constantly being told these messages that you're not good enough. Right. And that's really how I felt. 
But back on that sentiment of like, who am I to like represent? And it's exactly that because it's like when you're in that in between ground, that's exactly where you're supposed to be representing that place mm-hmm. because there's so many who are just in that like I'm in between two identities and I don't fully identify as one. Therefore, I don't feel like I belong in one. And there's more of us that can relate to that than we know it. So you are in the exact, and I say you and maybe others who feel like that, like who am I to represent Filipino culture or my own mm-hmm. heritage when I haven't been in it this long? And it's like, there are people waiting to hear just what you said mm, now that you're in the yeah. room for them to be like, oh, that's what I'm going through too. Like I'm not the mm-hmm. only one. And even when you share your story, Jelaine, like I was like, oh my gosh, that hits exactly what I've been ashamed to admit. <laughs> that I grew up not very proud of it. I was just like exposed to it, but I wasn't proud of it. And mm. so it's like you go from questioning like who am I to realizing I am in the right time and place and the exact person that needs Mm. to be promoting and representing these values and this part of identity. Filipino identity is so multifaceted. I think sometimes more multifaceted than others because we are just so spread out across the world. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, We have these like multi narratives and journeys that we just need to start being accepting about now. And so I love that you're finally... I'm saying that and also like and the way that you claim it is not by like saying oh it, it's me now I'm the one to represent it. it's like you're mm. giving spotlight back to those back in her homeland and you're mm. you're elevating those who've needed it. So that's such a beautiful role. I remember when I started this show and like started in the self-discovery about what being Filipino meant and what I'm being proud about. And I felt the exact same and like this is embarrassing. Like who am I? Because I have like my whole community and my cousins who have like called me whitewashed all my life. Yeah. 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 Or a banana. Yeah. 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 And you're kind of proud of it when you're younger. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's the weird thing. (laughs) You're so weirdly proud of it. Like, yeah, I guess I'm whitewashed. Like, why am I proud of that? I don't know. But anyways. And then like there was this like joke of like, oh, Crystal just found out that she was Filipino. Like my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) And all this stuff. (laughs) Yeah, it is. And it's just like, but you go from this like you just go through these evolutions of like what you had gone through, right? Or like where you did assimilate and you were proud of that and then realizing like there is something here to be proud about and like and then all of a sudden like, well, who am I to Mm -hmm. Elevate my culture, and then you go to like, oh, it's exactly me to play this mm-hmm. role because our brothers and sisters back home need need all the elevation that they can mm-hmm. get. And however, I can help them. I will do that. And yeah. and you're actually like this bridge, I guess, from from like the homeland to those of around the world who want to feel a genuine connection to their roots and their heritage. And I think it's just so creative and like such a hack to do it through fashion because that's mm-hmm. how people want to express themselves anyways. Yeah. I think, yeah, just to add to what you're saying, like it's interesting because I think for us as immigrant kids, especially we try to be perfect because we think that if we can work hard enough and be perfect enough, then people won't know that we're flawed or that we're humans mm. really. And wow. so like for myself doing this and going through that experience, I was like, I went through this period of anxiety where I was honestly like reading as much as I could. And we had all these like history books and I was like obsessively trying to learn and absorb as much as I could about everything Filipino, which is like an impossible feat. Mm. But I was really trying to, like, it was like, if I work hard enough, I can do this. And, and then I realized all those some point, loss and not learning. Yes, it. exactly. Yes, I can read every textbook ever written about a Filipino. Oh, <laughs> but and then at some point I realized like, okay, that's clearly impossible. And I will never be able to like learn all this. And there's I can never be this perfect Filipino. And then I started mm-hmm. like learning, or I guess I just started asking myself, like, what is a perfect Filipino? And wow. like, why do I feel this pressure? And where is this coming from? And I think once I finally leaned into the idea that like, I don't know everything, but at least I'm willing to learn, then yeah. that's what actually when our blog started growing even further, because that's yeah. when I started writing about different things that I wanted to learn more about and that I accepted I didn't know about. And I think even in terms of like who connects most with Canvio are people who, like you said, people in that in-between space, you know, Crystal, like you and I, people who are trying to understand what it is and like how to reconnect and 
yeah. And then, so we started writing, I started writing from that perspective and like sharing it openly. And now even still for a blog, when we work with writers to write content for us, that's something that I always tell them is like, you know, write this from the perspective of someone who's learning about some of these things for the first time. And Mm -hmm. like, we purposely, I even wrote it on our website for like our guidelines, which for writing, when people want to submit writing to us, one of the things is that we said is like, there is no such thing as being Filipino enough. And we want to promote different ways of being Filipino and different lived experiences. And I think that's why people have resonated so much yeah. with Cambio no, and her story. I was about to say, like when I go through the blogs and the articles and the stories, I love that it's through the lens of someone who is going through the learning and the discovery process and might have grown up with these multi in between narratives. And I feel like when I just even read the article titles, like it relates to me and it's something I want to click on because it's welcoming who I am. You know, (laughs) it's not like this like academic piece that you feel like an outsider of. It's like for real, like this is what my mom gave me advice about Filipino beauty and like Westerns, like this is what I grew up in. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can totally relate to this. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, that's awesome. I I really appreciate that. You are so intentional about that. And I, I do think that's what reaches people, just like the authenticity of like being real about where we're at, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think you said it so well. It's like just being real about where we're at. Yeah. (laughs) And do you feel like the storytelling shaped how people interacted with Cambio or like the dynamic of Cambio Mm -hmm. or the community Mm -hmm. around it formed? Yeah, it definitely has. It definitely has. Once we started sharing our stories in a deeper way and in a more nuanced way, and in a more personal way, because a lot of the stories in our blog are very personal. That's when it opened it up for other people to share their stories with us as well. And like the thing that the messages that we get from people are just so amazing. Like I cry <laughs> when I read them sometimes, but they, you know, people will share stories about like buying an a mommy piece, for example, and how this piece of jewelry from a mommy just reminds them of their Lola's who are no longer with oh. them. And it was like this necklace that their Lola always would wear every day. And like, this makes them feel closer and more connected oh, to, wow. to their, gra- yeah. And like, it's just these beautiful stories. And I realize as well, like how the things that we buy and the things that we own, like they're not just things mm-hmm. and there's so much attachment yeah, that we can yeah. have. Yeah. And so like, I think that's just what was, has been really amazing is like the more that we put things out there, like I really believe in a way there is, that's how the universe works. It's like the more things that you put out there, the more honest you can be and the most genuine you can be, that also invites other people to respond in kind. And that's really what we've seen with Cambio is like just quite amazing responses, even through COVID and like the things yeah. happening right now through COVID. It's like, these are really challenging times for everyone but we've gotten so much like amazing support from the community. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I know that you guys are even supporting like during COVID that the fashion industry, like they're even pivoting, trying to find mm-hmm. ways to be creative, resilient and, and compassionate to everything that's happening. And, and you guys are partnering that. Can you also describe how, mm-hmm. what that new, I guess, shift has been? Yeah, for sure. We've, started ever since March, since the since end of March, we actually began donating 5% of every purchase through Tammy & Co. to COVID relief efforts in Philippines. So we partnered with a nonprofit called Project Pearls that is serving food and providing essentials to some of the hardest hit and most vulnerable communities across Philippines. And they've been doing incredible work and Communities are really, really struggling, especially for people who are daily wage earners and people who were already in precarious situations, as we all have kind of heard, like people have been disproportionately impacted. So we started that fundraising campaign just as a way of like, we have this platform, let's see what happens. And we really didn't know what the response would be because, you know, no one really needs jewelry at a time like this what we realized is like, we're also more than just a shop. Like you had said earlier, like we also exist to be more than just a shop and we are a point of gathering for a community. And I think people have really responded in that way. So our sales have actually like been really one, like we've had incredible 
sales for the last few months since the pandemic started, which is actually mm-hmm. what was surprising for all of us. We actually even made the donation retroactive to March 16th, which is when the lockdowns in Philippines first started. So we made that retroactive. We sent advanced cash payments to our partners because our partners, essentially production has been halted for a lot of our partners in the Philippines. Because of the lockdowns, people just are not able to like either get materials to be able to work from home or they can't get to the office at all. So we have sent cash advances to help our partners continue to pay the artisans at least to make sure that they continue to receive wages. And then we also hosted a writing workshop I think last week or two weeks ago, we hosted a writing workshop, which also was 100% of the proceeds went towards COVID relief efforts to support communities in Mindanao. And to date, to date, we have fundraised over $1,500 for COVID relief efforts since March. That's amazing. Oh, man, that is just so heartwarming also to learn that those things are growing during this time that you know, the, the support is actually coming in more. Yeah. So, it's, it was really, it, yeah. Like it's been this amazing, amazing yeah. response. And yeah, I really think it's just like our community really wanting to support and be there for one another. And I think that's so special. Totally. So Jillian, last thing I wanted to cover, you said that a lot of things that people ask you, well, this isn't the last thing I want to cover. Sorry. I always say that (laughs) a lot more, but (laughs) one of the last few items I want to cover is you say a lot of things people ask you is how can I, as a Filipino in the U S or, you know, outside of another country, create bridges with people in the Philippines. And I want to know, of course, the answer to that, but why you think a lot of people are asking that question now? Because I do hear that a lot of like Mm. people wanting to find a bridge back to not just like the culture or like the concept of Philippines, but actual who are our brothers and sisters back home there and how can I create bridges to Mm. that? Yeah. Yeah. It's a wonderful question that people ask. And I think the heart of it is that it is another form of reconnection. It's like one of the most tangible ways to reconnect is to to be able to to feel like you're actually, you know, interacting with people in Philippines and better that you can actually feel like you are using your privilege, you know, the mere fact that we are in North America, like in the US and Canada, like that in itself is a privilege that many of our families have worked really hard to make it happen. And I think for many of us, like that question is really rooted in this idea of like wanting to use our privilege as a way to uplift other people in Philippines, Mm -hmm. which I think is like a really like beautiful gesture. So yeah, I think that's part of it. Like we, we acknowledge the fact that like we do have these Mm -hmm. platforms and access to resources and networks that people don't necessarily have in Philippines. And it's like, we just want to find a way to give back and to feel also Mm -hmm. more connected to home at the same time. So that's Mm -hmm. part of it. In terms of like my answer you know, the most simple thing is obviously supporting businesses that are in Philippines already. And yeah, like supporting businesses that are already in Philippines. A lot of people also then ask me, like, how can they give back to communities in Philippines and particularly artisans? And my answer is always like, you know, find people that are already doing amazing things and Mm -hmm. uplift them. Instead Mm -hmm. of starting from scratch and instead of necessarily feeling like you need to build your own platform, like what makes the most sense and what can actually empower the most people is by using existing structures and and really just finding ways to support people that are already doing the work. So that's really, you know, with Cambio, that's been our philosophy is like, how can we be a platform that uplifts? And that's the path that has made the most sense for us is using yeah. you know these online channels but i think what makes the most sense is like yeah again seeing what's out there doing the research like travel back to philippines if you're able to and you know just try to get an understanding of what is happening and who is doing what and you know surrounding yourself with just really interesting people yeah and i think i, I think from there if you can just find the people who really are doing things that are interesting and that make you feel passionate. That then, resonate with you. Yeah. yeah, that resonate with you. Then figure out a way to support them. Exactly. I think that's, yeah. 
I totally agree with that. And I like how you put it because I think in the beginning when you do start this like discovery and you want to have a, an impact, it can be almost overwhelming to be like, like, what change do I need to make? What do I need to build? Like, it's also I feel like you have to solve so many problems at once when in yeah. reality, there's already people out there who are building, who have been mm-hmm. working on this for so long that they yes. they don't really need more noise in this. Industry. Like, yeah, you know, exactly. they don't, yeah. it's, it's like more isn't the answer. It's just yeah. like um, yeah. the it's quality. <laughs> and like, exactly. And almost like what you did, it's like doing your research and just like getting in touch and in tune with the, what's already happening around you. Cause it's already yeah. been there before you even came in. And, mm-hmm. and then like, yeah. and then like doing a self check on like, what are my, what is my privilege? What role can yes. I play in this? That doesn't disrupt, yeah. but I am just like, yeah. And it's also like putting ego aside. Like I think yeah. as entrepreneurs, especially if you're talking about creating livelihood and working with marginalized communities, like you need to keep your ego in check and like, you need to know who you're serving. And I think, I think you had something that you had said earlier, Crystal, is like how with Cambio, it kind of moved away from being like, you know, just about us or just about me. And it said com- becoming about the community and the stories. Mm-hmm. And I think like yeah. that's been part of the journey and part of my own learning experience is like realizing like this isn't about me and this business isn't about me. And it should like what I want is for it to be able to exist like long term, even without me. And I think yeah. if we're talking about building sustainable businesses and social enterprises, like businesses that exist in order to really create an impact in the world that's positive, then we need to be able to think beyond like our own egos and like our own resumes and our own LinkedIn save your profiles. Complex. Yeah, like, yes. yeah, save your complex. Absolutely. Like you can't have that. <laughs> yeah, you just can't have yeah. that. There's no space for that in this kind of work. No, exactly. I love that. And even like on your page, when I see like what writers are putting forth and like what people are creating, it's it's like the work does its own self, you know, like mm. uh, when you just create the platform and you let the creators do what they do best and let them shine it like it grows bigger than what you might have even imagined it to be. Yeah. You know? Yes. And faster sometimes than you yeah. want it to or expect it to. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I love that. And thank you so much for touching on that. I'm sure it was like a self growth thing to even be like, always like putting the ego aside and letting, mm-hmm. um, seeing that you're part of something much bigger and letting that be the main point. And then your own thing grows faster and larger than it would have. Yeah. So um, I love that. And I really love your heart, Jalene, um, throughout all this. It just seems like you hold such a, a humble heart and always like listening to yourself and checking in with yourself. But also like I do feel like we as Filipinos can be hard on ourselves and kind, kind of see like like where we're going wrong. I, I think you promote this element of like grace, like giving yourself grace and like mm. forgiveness through the process of seeing like, okay, yeah, maybe that is not the right way, but this is how I'm going to shift because this is important to me. So I really mm. love like your heart with all this. Mm, thank you. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. So, um, well, I mean, like one last thing I love to, to just ask on is I used to say, like, if you had a message and advice to all Filipino women, but I think a more personal way to say this, <laughs> and I've been crafting this question, so you're going to be my first person to okay. answer this question Exciting. That, sure. <laughs> that I'm going to continue along from now on is if you could go back and be an ate to younger Delane and give her a message. <laughs> <laughs> what time period would you go back to and what would you say to her? Oh my goodness, time period. Um or like not what time period, like what yeah. point of your life would you go back to and what would you say to little Jillian? Hmm. I think what time period? For me, I just I would go back to university because I think university was that time of my life where you're like you have a lot of freedom for the first time in your life. And you don't know what to do with it, but you're also like extremely insecure. And like, it's one of those times also where you just want to feel like you can belong somewhere. Particularly for me, that was like one of those times when I felt that most. So I think what I would tell myself, like in university, I would say that it's okay to not be perfect. And that perfection is really not the point. And at the end of the day, like your value as a person is not tied to your output and it's not tied to the quality of your work and that you yourself 
are valuable and worthwhile regardless of what you do yeah and I think that I would also say like you know just take up the space that you need something that I've been thinking a lot about is also like just the luxury of taking time and taking space because oftentimes we feel like so rushed that we feel like we need to like speak quickly or if we're on the stage even when we're given the stage in the platform we feel like we should get off the stage as quickly as possible because we don't have the right to take up that much of people's time and I think what I would just say is like stop worrying so much about other people's time and you know refocus on your on yourself and like what you're trying to accomplish instead yeah so I think that's what I would tell myself is really like yeah (laughs) I love that especially that last part I'm just saying you hit a chord that has been so relevant to this time it's almost like you feel like you have to get your point across as soon as possible because Mm -hmm. you're taking up people's time but it's like you have value in what you say and how you choose to say it and on a day-to-day we're always giving people space like we have just as much right and value to take up that space and to take our time with it so yeah i love that and and delaine thank you for sharing that lastly related to everything we've been talking to to listeners to filipino listeners to people in other you know other communities what would you say is like what is the value of really being connected and knowing your roots Like, I feel like we've been talking about this realization of getting deeper and like more authentic with where you come Mm -hmm. from and value that. So like, what would you say is the value in getting truly connected to that? Mm, That's a really great question. For me personally, getting to know my roots has changed my life in the best way possible. And it hasn't always been an easy journey um, to unpack a lot of her history, to unpack my family's realities, but it's also just made me a much better person and a more compassionate person with other people, especially with my own family, but also with myself. And I think that that is part of the value of getting to know our roots and reconnecting with our roots is that we can really understand ourselves just so much better. There's so much that you learn about yourself when you are able to dig into our history and even dig into our language, you know, that is just, it's really telling. And there's a lot of knowledge in our ancestors and in our families that you would miss out on otherwise if you chose to ignore that part of yourself. It kind of feels like you're walking around with like a missing limb in a way and you don't realize that you're missing it until you find it and so I think that really is like it's just partly knowing yourself and learning how to love yourself in a different way and learning how to like love your family in a different way for me like the family part has been a really big aspect of it and just learning how to like have a more nurturing relationship with the people in my life as well as with my thoughts yes I love that. So it sounds like it's like the most important thing you could do. <laughs> <for> yourself, <laughs> Everyone yourself. should do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. This is, this has been such a beautiful, deep and like colorful discussion. I really enjoyed it. I think your questions also helped me learn about myself. No one ever actually asked me like, why is it important to connect mm-hmm. with your heritage? Or, like what has that brought you? And I think it helped me learn a lot about myself through like this conversation. It's like weird how you can surprise yourself with the answers that you say. And yeah. You're like, oh, you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so honored to have you on here. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so, I'm very, very honored. Thanks so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed that episode. Feel free to leave a comment and share with a friend. And if you haven't yet, follow us on Instagram at Filipina on the rise. I love hearing from you all and answering messages. Thanks so much again. And I'll see you on the next Filipina on the rise.